Let's open our Bibles this afternoon, beginning in Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs 21. I didn't preach an Easter message two weeks ago, although I did preach about the resurrection. In like manner, today I don't have a Mother's Day message, per se. I will be speaking today, though, about the great blessing and also the great responsibility of motherhood. But also, and in particular, we'll be speaking today about the great assault and the actual warfare upon the institution of motherhood in general that has been and that is now being waged by the pagan, antichrist culture of death that now pervades, permeates, and dominates this land of America. Today is the Lord's Day, by the way. The Lord's Day. And it's the one day every week every Christian should give to the Lord. And personally, I don't think the Lord's Day should have ever been overshadowed or replaced with or placed in competition with a holiday called Mother's Day. Personally, I think it was wrong for Congress to enact such a national holiday to be celebrated on the second Sunday of every month of May, as they did in 1914. And I think if they had thought we needed such a holiday, it should have been enacted on Friday or on Monday with all government offices closed down so we could have a three-day weekend, right? But they didn't do that. This may sound a little bit irreverent, but to carry that a step further, and we can argue this point if you like, but I don't think that there should be a special day set aside to honor all mothers just because they're mothers. The fact is that some mothers really aren't worthy of much honor. Mary and I know a few mothers who were and are horrible mothers, worthy of very little honor, if any. Mothers who have multiple children by multiple fathers so they can multiply their welfare receipts from the wicked socialist government of Washington, D.C., and then raise their kids to serve the devil, just like they do, with no knowledge of the Lord in their hearts, no discipline or proper training, and no direction to go but down. Some mothers really aren't worthy of much honor. And I'm going to say this. That is especially true in the very sad cases of the many millions of mothers across this land who decide to cop out of motherhood altogether, who have decided via the influence of this wicked American culture and of the devil himself to, in fact, have their own children murdered and put to death by the so-called doctors who staff the thousands of abortion clinics across this land. Those so-called doctors who, in mindless violation of their Hippocratic oaths, by which oath graduates from most medical schools still today agree to the code of ethics attributed to the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates to, quote, prescribe only beneficial treatments to refrain from causing harm or hurt and to live an exemplary personal and professional life. But these so-called doctors who sell their very souls to the devil to perform abortions instead, will stand before God one day to be judged as mass murderers, as cowardly serial killers of the worst order, who prey on innocent unborn children and who have worked together to perform well over 63 million abortions, acts of murder in this nation alone since the Roe versus Wade decision was handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973. As for the millions of mothers, who carry around the guilt of having obtained an abortion in their past. They need to know that they can find forgiveness for that great sin, as I will explain later in this message. It's hard to believe at this point, but there was a time over a century ago now when American society was, in fact, dominated much more by Christian culture than it is now. That was, to some extent, still true in 1914, when Mother's Day was enacted by Congress as a national holiday, In fact, the dear lady, Anna Jarvis, who sparked the national movement in the late 1800s to establish such a national holiday to honor her own mother, had it in mind as a day for families to visit their mothers and to escort them to church. That was her her view of Mother's Day. But once Mother's Day became a national holiday in 1914, it was not long before florists, card companies, candy companies, and other merchants capitalized on its popularity. So that by 1920, Anna Jarvis, who, by the way, remained childless her entire life, 
had become so disgusted with how the holiday had become so thoroughly commercialized that she actually publicly denounced the holiday and urged people to stop buying Mother's Day flowers, cards, and candies. And then she spent the latter part of her life and most of her wealth in legal fees filing lawsuits and lobbying Congress to have the holiday removed from the calendar. Fact of history. Anna Jarvis. All that said, there was a time when American society was, in fact, much more influenced by Christian culture than it is now. However, the culture of death that now pervades this land is not at all a new thing as far as the history of mankind is concerned. In fact, we read of that very same culture of death right here in Proverbs chapter 21, where the text says in verse 16, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The congregation of the dead. The way of understanding in this verse refers to the way of truth or the way of wisdom. That way leads to life, to prosperity, and to joy. In fact, we know that it refers to the way of God's truth and of God's wisdom. As God's word says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 8. God's truth and God's wisdom is actually personified in this chapter. Just as we know it was literally personified in the person of the Lord Jesus. As by the way, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, that Christ Jesus has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Here in Proverbs 8, we read at verse 1, Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places by the way in the places of the paths. She, wisdom, crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in of the doors. Unto you, O man, I call, says wisdom, my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, ye fools, be of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. From my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Wisdom says, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. Froward, of course, uh, meaning turning aside from the straight path. Verse 9, they are all plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. The words of wisdom make sense to the righteous man. Verse 10, receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. This entire chapter actually is about the wisdom of God and it presents God's wisdom as it was in fact personified in the person of the Lord Jesus. And so we read in verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning wherever the earth was. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the fountains of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, rejoicing in the habitable part of this earth. Verse 32, Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. And then wisdom says, verse 35, For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Wisdom is speaking there, personified in the person of the Lord Jesus. But then in the final verse of this chapter, we find that ancient culture of death, the congregation of the dead that now pervades American society. Verse 36 says, But he that sinneth against me, against wisdom and against the Lord Jesus, wrongeth his own soul. And then we read, All they that hate me love death. All they that hate me love death. All they that hate God's wisdom and who hate God's Son, the Lord Jesus, and who reject the wisdom and the righteousness and sanctification and redemption that he offers them. All they that hate him love death. And so, 
Turning back to chapter 21, Proverbs, in verse 16, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. That word remain in this verse is translated from the Hebrew as nuach. The word is used in quite a variety of applications, both literally and figuratively in various places. In some places it means to rest or to settle down in or to be confederate with, to identify with. And then as for the phrase congregation of the dead, in its immediate or its cursory sense, that phrase actually refers to the local cemetery. A simple paraphrase of the verse then in, this, in its immediate sense would be to say that a man that rejects God's wisdom is digging his own grave. That's the way to paraphrase that verse. A man who rejects God's wisdom is digging his own grave. But that actually may be a little bit too simple of a paraphrase because I believe a deeper meaning than physical death is no doubt in view here. Beyond the obvious reference to the grave and to those who are physically dead, I do believe there is an implied reference here to the greater part of humanity that is still alive and walking, but who are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. In that sense, the congregation of the dead refers to the masses of humanity that are dead to the truth of God. The majority of people that are living in deception, that are walking in darkness, having rejected the truth of God's word, and who are seen as dead in biblical terms because they cannot comprehend God's truth. They're spiritually dead. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 4, he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world, Satan the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The fact is that we who are now saved and who have been born again, as Jesus said, were once active members of that congregation of the walking dead. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, at one time we too walked, quote, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom Paul says we also had our conversation, our conduct in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Paul says, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But then, gloriously, Paul says, verse 4, But God, Ephesians 2, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. We are in the congregation of the dead. Dead in sins. But God hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. We read in Proverbs 21.16 that the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Well, I believe the Lord would have us to see from that verse, very important verse there in Proverbs. It's really the exact same thing that the Lord taught in his parable of the sower. In Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, which is that when a man rejects God's truth, God sends darkness. When you reject the light, God sends darkness. When a man has been exposed to God's truth, to God's light, and then he rejects it, or he wanders out of the way of the truth, he then will settle down, set himself down, and align himself with, identify himself with the congregation of the dead. He will identify himself with the mass of humanity that has rejected God's truth. And he has bought hook, line, and sinker into the devil's lies. And he is bound for an eternal hell unless he repents. And so that, in, in that sense, I believe Proverbs 21, verse 16, is somewhat an Old Testament parallel to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, 13 to 14, when he warned, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. But then Jesus said, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. 
We notice there in Matthew 7, 13 to 14, the contrast of the many who are on that broad road to destruction versus the few that are on the path to life. Many versus few. The foolishness of this world says the majority rules or democracy. The wisdom of God says the majority is walking in deception, does not know the right way to take, and is on the broad path to destruction. And that's why the Bible warns against following the crowd to do evil. And that's why pure democracy will never work and has always failed throughout history. The more rabidly reprobate segment of America's pro-choice crowd, those who hate God and therefore choose death, and thus demand what they in their reprobate minds foolishly call a fundamental right for women to murder their unborn babies. They're up in arms now out in large numbers to violently protest the news that the Supreme Court is preparing to overturn the Roe versus Wade decision. As most know by now, one of the Supreme Court justices, law clerks, uh, leaked to the Politico tabloid news outlet a, a draft proposal of Justice Alito's majority brief in the case of Dobbs versus Jackson, Women's Health Organization. That brief had been circulated among the other eight justices there for review prior to its release. The case again involves a Mississippi law banning abortions after 15 weeks. After hearing oral argument, the court voted five to four to let the Mississippi law stand, which in effect nullifies the former perception that Women have a right to an abortion, a fundamental right to an abortion. That a right to an abortion is uh, fundamentally protected in the federal constitution. The leak was unprecedented in the nation's history, as the court has always had a strict policy of secrecy going back to the nation's founding. Uh, all law clerks working for the Supreme Court are required to be licensed attorneys. And there is a long-standing requirement for all such law clerks to swear an oath of secrecy in regard to decisions under consideration, that oath is to be as sacred and inviolable as attorney-client privilege, a violation of which will result in the one who leaked this draft opinion, once he's discovered, will be immediately and permanently disbarred, never to practice law again. But whoever it is knew that when they leaked the draft in the first place and apparently thought it was worth the price of sound and alarm. And so the pro-death crowd uh, the culture of death in America is up in arms over this decision. Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said in a joint statement on Monday, quote, the Supreme Court is poised to inflict the greatest restriction of rights in the past 50 years, not just on women, but on all Americans. They said the Republican appointed justices reported votes to overturn Roe versus Wade would go down as an abomination, they say. Abomination, one of the worst and most damaging decisions in modern history, says Nancy Pelosi. Several of these conservative justices who are, they said, who are in no way accountable to the American people have lied to the U.S. Senate, they said, lied to the U.S. Senate, ripped up the Constitution, they say, and defiled both precedent and the Supreme Court's reputation, all at the expense, they say, of tens of millions of women who could soon be stripped of their bodily autonomy and their constitutional rights they relied on for half a century. Hogwash. There never was any constitutional right for women to get an abortion. Never was. The justices here are upholding the Constitution, not stripping us of it. They're finally upholding the Constitution in this area, in this regard. As Pelosi and Schumer both know, there never was any constitutionally protected right for any woman to have her own child murdered. And for that reason, for almost 50 years now, the pro-life side of this national argument has launched peaceful, uh, respectful protests and abortions, uh, which is as it should be. But now the protests being launched by the pro-death side are taking a far more rabid and violent tone with demonstrations being planned even against the Supreme Court justices' homes, we hear, which the far left's fearless leader, Joe Biden, has refused to discourage or denounce. Instead, this past Wednesday, the uh, supposed Roman Catholic Joe Biden said during press remarks that, quote, the right to an abortion comes from being a child of God. That's Joe Biden's theology. The right to an abortion comes from being a child of God. When no true child of God in her right mind 
would ever go out and get an abortion. Clearly, however, Joe Biden has no idea what it means to be a true child of God. Joe said, quote, I believe I have the rights that I have, not because the government gave them to me, but because I am a child of God. I exist. Then he said, I delegated by joining this union, American state, here to delegate some rights I have to the government for social good. I joined this union here to delegate some rights I have to the government for social good. Why he said that was beyond me at the time, but by the way, it does society no good for anyone to give up any of his fundamental rights. It does no social good for anyone to give up his rights. And no good government would ever ask or expect any of its citizens to do so. That's something only a despotic and a tyrannical government would do, like we have in Washington, D.C. And then Joe said this, quote, I don't want to get into a debate with you on theology, but you know, well, anyway, I'm not going to make a judgment for other people. He said, quote, I respect people who don't support Roe versus Wade. I respect their views. I respect those who believe life begins at the moment of conception and all. I respect that. Don't agree, he said, but I respect that. Not going to impose that on people, says Joe. Joe Biden wouldn't debate theology because the lifelong Jesuit Knight of Malta, Joe Biden, just like his uh, Jesuit papa, Pope Jorge Bergoglio, and all their Jesuit buddies in high places of power around the globe, alleged Roman Catholic Nancy Pelosi included, don't give a rip about theology, about sound theology or what the what God thinks or what the Bible says. However, every true child of God does care about the fact that God says very clearly in his word, the Bible is crystal clear that from the moment, from the very instant of conception, the spark of life that develops inside the mother's womb through its various stages is a separate individual. It is a person. It is human life, and it is indeed a person whose very right to life is to be afforded and protected inside the womb. We see that both in the Old Testament and in the New. In the 139th Psalm, King David says, His relationship with the Lord began way back when he was still inside his mother's womb. He says in Psalm 139, verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. He says, verse 15, My substance was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret, David says in verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, meaning the bones that give form and strength to the body, yet being unperfect, unfinished. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. David says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! In these verses, David says, His relationship with the Lord began way back, when he was still inside his mother's womb. As we also read of John the Baptist, by the way, who leaped inside his mother Elizabeth's womb when he heard the voice when he heard the voice of Mary, the mother of our Lord, who came to visit Elizabeth. Luke one forty four, Elizabeth exclaimed, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. While yet in, still inside the womb, the as yet unborn John the Baptist heard the voice of Mary no doubt for the first time, and immediately, by revelation of the Holy Ghost, because the angel told Zechariah he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from, from the womb, he immediately knew who that voice belonged to. That was a revelation from the Holy Ghost. And that knowledge filled that unborn child with joy to the point where he leaped inside the womb of his mother. What more proof would any so-called trained theologian need? be able to dogmatically and unbendingly conclude that the separate and distinct life of a human being, a person, begins long before birth, even in the womb. By the way, the word babe that's used there by Elizabeth of the baby yet in her womb is the very same word that used both in the Greek and English that was used by the angel of the Lord about Jesus after he was born. That word babe or baby is used both of John the Baptist before he was born and of the Lord Jesus after he was born. The point is that the Bible makes no distinction between babies before they are born and babies after they are born. The Bible in no way justifies the distinction 
a separate terminology used by today's death cult and by the Supreme Court, by the pro-abortion movement, that before birth, the entity inside the womb is just a fetus. It's not a baby. No, it's a baby. It's a baby. That word fetus is used to redefine and mystify that precious baby as merely an inanimate blob of flesh. Instead, the Bible says that is a baby both before and after it's born. I would add in here that the question of when life begins is not only an issue of theology or Bible doctrine, it can easily be answered by elementary biology. As Paul says, creation itself shows the rabid pro-abortion, pro-murder crowd that human life begins inside the womb, not outside. For more than 100 years, medical science has known conclusively that every individual's life begins at the moment of conception. In 1977, the Chicago Tribune published an article about a Montreal conference of scientists that had just released a wealth of new DNA research, concluding that, quote, the overriding message of all this new research is that the life of a baby begins at conception. Informed care of that child must also begin at conception or even before if he or she is to have a good chance for a healthy life. By the way, very few abortions are performed before a child is seven weeks old. Usually the mother doesn't even know that she has a child until the child is seven weeks old. And by that time, the child has already developed into what can only be defined as a living human being, a person. At 22 days old, the heart begins to beat with the baby's own blood often a different type of blood than the mother's. And by the way, speaking of blood, we know in Leviticus chapter 17, God says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. God says, biological science proves that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Life is not contained in the air. It's not in the lungs, as today's death cult tries to say. As some fools like Bill Clinton says, a baby isn't human until it starts to breathe air. Amen. Hogwash. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and that baby's heart is pumping blood at 22 days old. Now to justify infanticide and after-birth abortion, the death cult in America, the congregation of the dead, the rabid baby killers are actually starting to say that the baby isn't even human until it can feed itself. They do that so they can justify in their tiny, reprobate little minds the killing off of the elderly through euthanasia. By the way, God also says that the elderly are supposed to be honored and cared for by their families, not passed off to be put to death or to take care of our parents as they get old. At week five, the baby has developed eyes, legs, and hands. At week six, brain waves are detectable, mouth and lips present, fingernails forming. At week seven, Eyelids and toes form. There's a distinct nose. The baby is kicking and swimming. By week eight, every organ is in place. Bones begin to replace cartilage, and fingerprints begin to form. By the eighth week, the baby can begin to hear. By week 12, the baby has all, all organs necessary to experience pain. Oh, including nerves, spinal cord, and thalamus. Vocal cords are complete. The baby can grasp objects placed in his hand, can suck his thumb, can turn his head, frown and hiccup. At 20 weeks, the baby recognizes its mother's voice. And this also, by the way, is the earliest at which partial birth abortion is performed. Babies can routinely be saved to live outside the womb at 21 to 22 weeks after fertilization. And sometimes they can be saved even younger. Turn over to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21. So first we see what the Bible clearly says, and as this is supported by biological science, that a separate individual human life begins inside the womb, and even at the very moment of conception. Now, even inside the womb, that baby already possesses intelligence, perception, the ability to reason and to think, and even to experience emotion and pain, or no doubt even fear and horror and extreme pain as it is literally torn limb from limb and his life is taken from it by the abortionist baby butcher. This awful truth was borne out and proven by an observed uh, biological science and even in video recordings of babies being aborted. 
as was graphically and painfully exposed in the gruesome 1984 video presentation titled Silent Scream. It records via ultrasound an abortion taking place in the uterus. As that procedure is narrated step by step by a former abortionist who repented of his crimes, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Back to the point, there's no excuse for any so-called trained theologian, as was mentioned in the, in the Roe versus Wade majority opinion, not to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Bible says, that God says, that biological science proves that life begins inside the womb and from the moment of conception, then beyond that. God also says that the life of the unborn child is to be protected, even while that baby is still inside the womb. God says that in his law. We see that very plainly stated in, first in the Mosaic Law at Exodus chapter 21. Shortly after thundering the Ten Commandments from heaven in, in Exodus chapter 20, God then says to Moses in chapter 21 and verse 22, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her. In other words, she gives birth to the child, and yet no must have follow. In other words, the baby's not hurt, the baby survives. He, the attacker there, shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. Meaning in a case like that, the father of the child and the injured mother will bring their complaint to the judges, who will then determine how the perpetrator is to be punished for his crime. That being the crime of injuring the mother and endangering the life of that unborn baby. Let me read in verse 23. And if any mischief follow, meaning if the baby dies, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, Amen. tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, etc., etc. Even in this now pagan, post-Christian, anti-Christian, death culture society, there's still enough residual remnants of Christian culture that even most pagans today have heard that phrase from the Bible saying punishment for crime should be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, etc., etc. But I'd venture to say that very few who have heard that familiar phrase have any idea of the context in which that phrase is found in the Bible. That well-known phrase is found in the context of God's command that the life of the child within the womb is to be protected. And that a man who brings harm to an unborn child, if that child dies, must then forfeit his own life and be put to death himself. However, sadly, America no longer cares what God says. It's quite clear that neither of the two alleged Roman Catholics, Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi, give a rip what God says or about sound theology, and neither do court Jews Chuck Schumer or Bernie Sanders. That's the case with America's congregation of the dead, this death culture. Turn now over to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. As mentioned earlier, some mothers really aren't worthy of much honor. However, as the Bible says here in Proverbs 31, in the latter half of verse 30, a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised. And that, by the way, not just one special day a year. But on a regular basis throughout every week, if not every day. And the reason she shall be praised is what? Because she fears the Lord. That means she's a woman of faith who not only believes in and loves the Lord, but who also determines to follow and to obey his word out of holy fear of being out of fellowship with him. That holy fear of the Lord then motivates her actions and drives her decisions. We see that throughout this chapter, what this chapter is devoted to. Verse 25, we read, Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. Verse 26, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness, meaning she's not lazy. She is continually tending to her family's needs. And so we read in verse 28, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Why do they praise her and call her blessed? 
She is worthy of praise because she fears the Lord. And because she fears the Lord, she properly serves her family. She's a woman of faith whose holy fear of the Lord then motivates her actions and drives her decisions, which means, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22 and verse 33 also, that she voluntarily humbles herself and submits herself to her husband, recognizing, as Paul says in the next verse there in verse 23 of Ephesians 5, that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And so she voluntarily submits herself to him and reverences her husband, as Paul says then in verse 33. Even when she knows the big lummox doesn't deserve it. Why? Because she fears the Lord. She conducts and she clothes herself in a discreet and chaste manner, as Paul says in Titus 2, verse 5, not flaunting herself before other men. Her beauty and her adorning is, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 3 to 4, not the showing off of herself outwardly, but is instead what Peter calls the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. This is why the woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Her children will rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. For the woman who fears the Lord and conducts herself as a godly Christian, every day, every day should be Mother's Day. Turn to Psalm 127. It's very sad that America's culture of death, the congregation of the dead, cannot grasp the wonderful truth that God gives us in this psalm through David, the ancient prophet and king of Israel. We read in Psalm 127 in verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. In other words, unless the Lord is our defender, all other defenses we try to build will be totally useless. Verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he, be, he giveth his beloved sleep. In other words, when the Lord is our defender as he surely is for every true child of God, all who are born again and regenerated from above by faith in Jesus, there is no need for us to stay up late at night worrying about any outside threat from Vladimir Putin or anybody else. No need for us to worry. But for America, the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and every nation that forgets God. And all the nuclear missiles possessed by America, Russia, and China put together, all the surveillance satellites, all the conventional armaments, the airplanes, the submarines, and the ships in the seas will be to no avail. They will not save America from the judgment that will come upon it. The wicked shall be turned into hell and every nation that forgets God and America has forgotten God. But then God gives this wonderful truth in verse 3. Lo, Children are inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are such a blessing. Aside from our great salvation, our spouse, and then our children are, in fact, the greatest blessings of our lives. It's very sad that the world's culture of death, the congregation of the dead, and in particular, the feminist movement within that congregation, sees children rather than the greatest blessing of their lives, instead as a burden, as a hindrance to the typical feminist woman who today would rather pursue a business career than to pursue the greatest, most honorable, the most noble, and most fulfilling career that any woman on this earth can pursue, which is to be a God-fearing, godly mother who determines to raise godly, Christ-believing children for the honor and glory of God. Happy is the man who has such a wife, and who therefore has a quiver full of children. I don't know how many arrows a typical warrior's 
quiver could hold. Some say seven is a reasonable number. Some Christians are hesitant to have more than just a couple of children thinking they can't afford it. Mary and I decided after we had two children and moved to Tampa, when I had not yet started my own business and we were having lots of trouble making ends meet, we still decided, we determined that Mary would stay home with the children and guide the house, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.14. In other words, she would manage the household while I went to work. And then by the time we had five children, and after a couple of miscarriages, we learned and we can testify today that the Lord does not provide children to a Christian family, but he will also not provide all for that family needs. Amen. Turn to Second Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles. As for the upcoming Supreme Court decision in Dobbs versus Jackson and Women's Health. Many are wondering about the timing of both the decision and the draft leak, presuming that there's some ulterior motive here, perhaps to drive the already inflamed wedge of division in America even deeper than it is already, to cause the very type of uproar that we are seeing now nationally. Personally, I don't think there's an ulterior motive here beyond actually correcting what was once a very unconstitutional, very political, and very poorly reasoned decision in Roe versus Wade. I think the Supreme Court's finally doing what they should have done a long time ago. There's no way to know for that for sure, or even to know at this point how this leak uh, may affect or possibly change the final outcome of that decision. What we do know is that even if Roe versus Wade is overturned at this point, no one will be able to take comfort or rest back, foolishly thinking victory has been achieved and revival has come to America. In my opinion, revival will not come to America because America's judgment is already on the way. We read in Second Chronicles in verse 2 that one of Judah's most wicked of all of its kings, Hezekiah's son Manasseh, quote, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and he reared up altars for Balaam, and, for, and he made groves, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. Verse 4, also he built altars in the house of the Lord. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom, offered them to Molech, pagan god Molech, burned his children to this pagan god Molech. Also he observed times and used enchantments, he used witchcraft, dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. But then you'll see later in that chapter, we read that late in his life Manasseh repented and he, he turned back to the Lord. But his repentance was not enough to stay God's hand of judgment because the writing was already on the wall. So we read in 2 Kings chapter 24, 2 Kings 24 of Judah's final destruction, where it says in 2 Kings 24 verse 3, page is still turning away to get there, 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24 verse 3, we read, Surely at the commandment of the Lord, came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight. Why? For the sins of Manasseh. This is after he repented. For the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. America, the land of America, has been filled with innocent blood of 63 and a half million murdered unborn children. I would presume that's a lot more innocent blood than Manasseh ever shed. And if God drove Israel out of their land, destroyed Jerusalem, his city that he chose, he'll do that to America too. But in the wink of an eye, the handwriting was already on the wall for Manasseh, for Judah and for Jerusalem, just as it is for America today. The pro-abortion death cult in America is very closely linked with and partnered up with the ever-growing homosexual sodomite culture in this land. It's almost one and the same movement. And as Vladimir Putin is warning of nuclear strikes against NATO nations who help arm Ukraine, and as Joe Biden and the fools in Congress think Putin is bluffing 
and they keep sending arms into Ukraine that the decimated Ukrainian army can't use anyway because the Russians destroyed all the rail lines going to the front. And just as archaeological evidence proves that God really did rain fire and brimstone down on the ancient historical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, just as we read of in the book of Genesis, so in like manner, I do believe God is preparing to rain fire and brimstone down on this sodomite, antichrist, death-loving nation of America. Just as we read in Revelation chapter 18, for his sins have reached unto heaven, verse 5, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Verse 9, and the kings of the earth, those NATO nations who have committed fornication and, to live, and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Thankfully, we can say with holy boldness that this world is not our home, and that Joe Biden is not our supreme leader, and neither was Donald Trump, by the way. Thank God we can say, as it was said of the early Christians in Acts 17, that we serve another king, one Jesus, Amen. whom the Apostle Paul said is our blessed and only potentate, Amen. king of kings and lord of lords. He is our king. Amen. Like Abraham, we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. This wicked sodomite nation, this death-loving nation of America, and this wicked world is not our home. Because as Peter says, we have an inheritance and a home that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you and for me, for us. For those who may hear this message online, who are carrying around with them the guilt and shame and responsibility of having had an abortion performed in their past, you need to know that there is cleansing and forgiveness to be found in the blood of Jesus. The Apostle Peter denied Jesus three times, but was forgiven, restored, and used mightily by the Lord to build his early church. The Apostle Paul was himself a murderer of Christians, arresting them and dragging them to Jerusalem to be executed for what he thought was their idolatry and blasphemy. But he too was forgiven, restored, and also used mightily by the Lord to write most of the New Testament. The Lord Jesus said, All manner of sin may be forgiven men thanks to His amazing grace, that unmerited favor, undeserved favor that He showed us in taking all of our sins to the cross, dying for us there and in our place so that we could be declared righteous by His resurrection from the dead three days later. We could not earn His salvation by our own good works or by our own merit. And God sees our feeble attempts to do so as filthy rags, by the way. We can't pay for our own sin, aside from going to hell for them. Instead, we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us up together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Paul says there in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by God's grace through faith in the cleansing power of Christ's redeeming blood. And Jesus said you can be forgiven of all of your sin if you'll just believe on the Lord Jesus. Thank God for His amazing grace. Amen. After a word of prayer, we'll turn to hymn number 229. This, this world is not my home. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank You for Your Word, for the clarity of it, for the wisdom of it, for the conviction that it brings, for the absolute truth that it brings to those who will receive it. Lord, please give us wisdom on how to conduct ourselves in this evil day. Give us boldness and courage to stand in this evil day for you. Please give us, Lord, your grace, your divine enablement 
enable wives today to fear the Lord and to be the kind of wives they're supposed to be. Please enable us as husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And Lord, please enable the children here to honor their parents the way you call them to do, to obey them. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your grace. We praise you in Jesus' name.